dual enrollment classes work. Research shows dual enrollment gets more students to attend and complete college, but not everyone has access. What is dual enrollment? With a grade of C or higher, these classes students take in high school transfer directly to college as college credit. New research shows students taking dual enrollment classes are more than twice as likely to go to college than students who are not. Research also shows dual enrollment is even more impactful for students who are male, Hispanic, low income, and in special ed. Dual enrollment students are also more likely to stay enrolled in college, earn higher GPAs, and complete their degree. By earning college credits, students taking dual enrollment can also save money later on college tuition. But not everyone has access to dual enrollment classes. Research shows nearly half of Arizona schools don't offer it, and less than 25% of Arizona's high school graduates have taken at least one dual enrollment class. But help is on the way. More than $15 million has been earmarked in the state budget to help students pay for dual enrollment, and priority will be given to students from low-income backgrounds. Starting this upcoming school year, freshmen and sophomores can qualify for up to $300, juniors and seniors up to $600. Enrollment is now underway for classes that start in the fall, and teachers can earn a one-time bonus of up to $1,000 to teach dual enrollment classes. They can earn their credentials for free through the Arizona Teachers Academy. Dual enrollment works. Dual enroll dual enrollment class. As this funding is both historic and urgent, there's a lot of attention from all parts of the state. We're very fortunate to have with us today to from the office of Governor Katie Hobbs, Celiana Chang, who's the policy advisor for K-12 education, and Aaron Hart, who's the policy advisor for higher education and early education. Thank you both for joining us. Celiana, the floor is yours. Thanks, Travis. Um, I'm going to kick things off on our behalf and then turn things over to Celiana. But on behalf of Governor Katie Hobbs, we want to welcome you all and thank you, Helios, for convening this important conversation today. We wanted to reiterate how important dual enrollment is to Governor Hobbs, and she's made expanding dual enrollment a key priority here in Arizona. And that's because we see dual enrollment as an effective way to accelerate post-secondary education for Arizona high school students. And the data that you'll hear about today backs that up. Dual enrollment allows students to hit two birds with one stone, to meet their high school graduation requirements and to begin earning college credit. This makes a student's path to post-secondary a post-secondary degree faster and at less cost to students and their families. It also gives students a vision for their future, and it makes it real the idea that a post-secondary education is possible. Dual enrollment is a meaningful way and pathway for students, especially those who are low income and students of color, to have a way to get to higher education and great jobs. So to continue the conversation, I'll turn it over to Celiana. Hi, everyone. Um, to continue on Aaron's uh, comments, we know that dual enrollment matters to students in Arizona and not only to the students, but to their families and to the entire state. As we look into the future, we know that most careers in Arizona are going to require some type of post-secondary education or advanced training. Unfortunately, today, only around 48% of Arizonans have attained a post-secondary degree or credential, which is short of our state's goal of achieving 60% attainment. By the, year of, by the year 2030. When education attainment increases in our communities, our communities become stronger and individuals and families have more opportunities to succeed. For all these reasons, Governor Hawes prioritized dual enrollment funding during her first six months in office. We were thrilled to partner with Helios, the Phoenix Chamber and Maricopa Community Colleges to advocate and secure funding in the budget to expand dual enrollment opportunities across the state. Today, you'll hear more about this initiative during the webinar, along with data and stories that will affirm why dual enrollment matters so much and is beneficial to Arizona students. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Celiana and Aaron. We're really grateful for your leadership uh, and the leadership of Governor Hobbs on this important work. We really appreciate you spending some time with us today. Uh, at Helios Education Foundation, our work is grounded in research to understand why issues matter and the potential impact they have in the state. To share why and what matters about dual enrollment, 
I invite my colleagues from Helios to join us. Janice Palmer, who is Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Government Affairs, and Kimberly Lent Morales, who is our Director of Research and Evaluation. Uh, Kimberly, uh, kick us off. Great, thanks so much, Travis. So earlier this year, Helios released a research brief looking at dual enrollment access in Arizona and the relationship between dual enrollment participation and college success outcomes. For the next few minutes, I'll share the findings from this research and what Arizona advocates can do to support more students to go into dual enrollment. And then I'll turn it over to Janice to talk about some recent policy wins in this space. So moving us on to the next slide, it's important to understand why we did this research study. And you'll notice our motivations were highly aligned with what Celiana and Aaron shared from the governor's office. So first off, like they mentioned, a college degree is critical for Arizona residents to thrive in our state. In partnership with Education Forward Arizona, Helios actually recently published the research findings on the value of college degrees to individuals, families, communities, and our state. And again, like Celiana mentioned, these are more than just monetary. They include better health and safer communities. And for most students, waiting until senior year of high school is way too late to start conversations about college and the life after high school. Dual enrollment is one avenue to start students thinking about college earlier in their K-12 journey and help them jumpstart their college experience. Additionally, additionally, sorry, there's a wealth of prior research that Helios is building off of that shows that dual enrollment helps students attend college, have higher GPAs, and complete their degree like we saw in the video. So for this project specifically, we partnered with the Arizona Department of Education to look at the extent to which public high school students are taking dual enrollment classes at their local community colleges. And then how does success in dual enrollment relate to college going and persistence? So if we go to the next slide, <laughs> looking at our first, and yeah, thanks. And so looking at our first research question, we had a few takeaways. And if we move on to the next one, we'll see some of this data. So first, the number of students who participated in dual enrollment grew from the graduating class of 2017 to the class of 2020. Second, on the next slide, we wanted to see what types of courses did students take. Looking at all the subject areas that were possible for students in dual enrollment, we found three most common courses, English, math, and career and technical education. And when you look at the participation rates per subject area, they've remained pretty stable over those four year periods. And then going on to the next slide, the degree of participation growth was not uniform for all student groups. Looking at female students versus male students, female students had a higher participation rate and their growth of participation rate was greater than that of male students. Another important group to look at is income. So by income status, non-low income students were significantly more likely to participate in dual enrollment compared to low income students. While this gap does give us really good insight into which students we need to start targeting and who are underrepresented in dual enrollment, we see that there was a 34% growth in the number of low income students who took dual enrollment. And that's a positive upward trend. Carolyn, I think there's someone talking, so if you can mute them, thank you. On the next slide, we looked at student race and ethnicity and school geography. So on this first slide with race and ethnicity, there's quite a bit of data. So I will break it down for you. And I hope that you'll read the report so you can dissect it a little bit more on your own time. So our main finding by race and ethnicity is that white and Asian students were most likely to participate while Hispanic and black students were the least likely to participate in dual enrollment courses over the entire period of the study. Breaking it down by school geography, we actually saw little differences based on where a student went to high school. In city, urban, and rural high schools, they all hovered around 24% participation rate. And again, these findings, Janice is going to talk a little bit more when she talks about the policy initiatives that have been implemented to help support some of these differences. So moving along, the next phase of our study looked at the relationship between dual enrollment and post-secondary success. So the first way we're defining success is students who enrolled in college. So for this, for this purpose, we are looking at students who got a C or better, again, like the video said, and what did that mean when they enrolled in college? And we found some really positive findings. So if we move to the next slide, when we compare students who succeed in dual enrollment to their non-dual enrollment peers, 
dual enrollment students throughout the study period were around two times as likely to enroll in college. That's a pretty big difference. And this graph here shows odds ratios, which again are the look at how much more likely are our dual enrollment students than their non-dual enrollment peers to attend college. And again, we hope that you'll dig in more when you get to the study. We saw the greatest differences by subgroup for male students, low-income students, and students with an IEP. And you'll notice from the previous slides where we talked about participation grade, participation rates, these were some of the lowest participating student groups overall. Finally, we looked at success in dual enrollment influences on college persistence. So we can move to the next slide. And that means did students show up to their second year of college? On the next slide, you'll see that dual enrollment success and persistence weren't quite at the same magnitude as college enrollment. So overall, for the classes of 2017, 2018, and 2019, dual enrollment students were around 1.2 times more likely to persist to their second year than compared to their non-dual enrollment peers. And when we're comparing dual enrollment students to non-dual enrollment students by that subgroup category again, high income males and students without an IEP were more likely to persist. So now what do these research findings mean on that impact of dual enrollment and what can we actually do? On the next slide, we'll talk about our recommendations that fall into three main buckets. So the first is to increase equitable access to dual enrollment. As we saw in the participation rates, certain male group, certain groups such as males, Hispanics, and low-income students are less likely to participate in dual enrollments. However, these students were the most likely to succeed in college and persist once they went on to college. So by striving for equitable access, more students can reap the benefits of dual enrollment. Additionally, like we saw in the video, approximately 200 local education agencies offer no type of dual enrollment at all. So combating access barriers, it's not a one size fits all solution. In some cases, it means finding ways to cover tuition costs for students and families. Other times it means increasing the number of dual enrollment courses offered at an individual high school or district or offering them at all having enough certified teachers to teach these courses, looking at eligibility standards. So what standards are we setting to even let students into these courses? And are they aligned with which students could actually succeed in the course? And increasing reliable transportation for those students who are taking dual enrollment courses on a college campus. So with that in mind, we need to ensure that students and families have the information about dual enrollment and what they can accomplish um, through targeted advising. And again, this is really important for those underrepresented students who might not have the information that all students have. So however, this advising comes from multiple sources. So it's important to take a holistic look at this. So that means talking to families, school counselors, and teachers, making sure everyone has the right information to help students make the right choice for them. And lastly, Across the nation, we're seeing a growing movement in post-secondary education towards the guided pathways model. At the foundation of this model, it's ensuring that students have a clear understanding of the college degree requirements and remain on track to complete their degree. There's been recent interest to extend these pathways down to K-12 and ultimately creating a more thorough view for students to see how their journey starts in K-12 and goes on to degree completion. In some cases, this even means operating, operating under a framework that defaults to all students taking dual enrollment or other rigorous coursework, and then helping them understand how do those college credits articulate into agree, making sure that they're taking the right courses at the right time that will help satisfy their future college degree requirements. So now that we've gone through the research and some of our recommendations from the report, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Janice, who's going to talk more about the recent policy changes that align with these recommendations. Janice, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you, Kimberly. And this research really was critical for us to make the case at the Capitol to fund dual enrollment. And we were able to successfully secure $15.5 million in support of dual enrollment. And truly, this would not have happened without the strong support of Governor Hobbs. So thank you, Celiana, Aaron, um, our amazing sponsor, Senator Steve Kaiser, and the Phoenix Chamber and Maricopa Community Colleges, all who are down there pushing very, very hard on this. 
So the policy implementation language uh, ultimately was included in the K-12 budget um, bill, Senate Bill 1729. And what it outlines is that $15 million specifically is dedicated to help defray the cost to students. You might wonder where that $15 million comes from. And that is if every, based on what we'll talk about the specifics, if every low income student in grades nine, 10, 11, and 12 that is low income took the maximum amount of credits that $15 million would cover those costs. So if that $15 million priority is given to low-income students, students in grades 9 through 10 are eligible for up to six credit hours for $50 um, per credit hour. Students in grades 11 through 12, up to 12 credit hours for $600 per year. What's important is that we want to make sure that students are passing these courses, so you must pass with an A, B, or C, and have a GPA of 2.5 or higher moving forward to ensure that we continue to have students see success, um, not just being put into these courses. And then also it must, any of the dual enrollment courses must fulfill a lower uh, division general education credit or if it's a CTE course, it must result in a certificate, credential, and license. And one important aspect on this that is, that is also included in the policy language is that while the credit hour and reimbursement is based upon the student, what will actually happen is that the monies generated will be provided to the provider. And it is outlined within statute that the, those providers include a community college, a university, or an institution that provides a qualifying dual enrollment credit. Uh, next slide. In addition, the $500,000 is dedicated to honor teachers who earn their dual enrollment certification, must be a new teacher earning that certification and provide instruction in at least one course. And then there is provided a one-time $1,000 incentive bonus. So that's what's included in the legislation. And now to get into the details, I'm going to turn it over to President and CEO, Paul Luna, to meet with our uh, illustrious panel. Thank you, Janice. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Paul Luna. I'm the President and CEO of Helios Education Foundation. Uh, and I want to just begin as well by echoing our thanks and appreciation. Uh, first off, to, to all of you who have taken the time out of your busy schedule to join us today, to be part of this webinar, to give us an opportunity to exchange this information and talk specifically about the importance of dual enrollment and, and the impact that can have on our state from an education attainment standpoint to a workforce development standpoint. So many uh, elements of success that we see for our state moving forward, and in particular through education, comes through highlighting these types of unique opportunities of how we can improve all student, student outcomes for, for all students, uh, but especially those as, as we're highlighting with some of the work here, uh, specifically to traditional underserved students and, and communities uh, and low-income students. So uh, we wanna again thank all of you for taking the time to be with us today. Uh, I wanna acknowledge uh, the Helios team, many of whom have put a lot of energy and effort into putting this webinar together. Uh, our friends at Collaborative Communications, Carolyn and Terry, who, who are great support and partners with us in these types of activities. Uh, and to echo the thanks to those who are joining us as, uh, as really kind of guests of the webinar, but really important guests too. Siliana and Aaron from Governor Hobbs' office and all their work leading up to the webinar today and, and the work that we've just been talking about. Uh, as well as the, the panel that I get to now moderate of uh, that, that has additional speakers and viewpoints that I think are important for us to share today. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is really important as we have kind of set the context for this conversation and the panel discussion we're about to have, as well as any questions uh, from the audience you might have, is, is to acknowledge that um, access to dual enrollment, really grounded in that research that we've we've highlighted just a little bit here, um, really proves to be a significant driver of student success beyond high school in, in post-secondary education. Um, and secondly, and I think just as importantly, we, we need to also acknowledge how uh, it, it really starts to change the culture, the college-going culture for many students' families. You know, we think about dual enrollment, uh, uh, not just about access to the college coursework and the learnings per se, but, but the impact that it has on a student. You know, as we know in high schools, many times students are often asked, 
oh, you know, uh, are, are you college bound or are you a college student? Do you see yourself as a college student? And, and one of the real impacts of, of dual enrollment is when a student is able to have access to dual enrollment, participate, be successful, it really removes that question. Because by definition, that student in high school taking these courses, being successful, they are college students. And I think it changes the way the students think of themselves, the way we think of them, the way the families come together as well. Uh, so we think there's so many different important elements to why dual enrollment will have such a significant impact on students in our state. The other thing we know that it does as well is think about the power of, of a student, maybe that first generation college student who's able to uh, receive college coursework credit while in high school. Uh, and how important that is then in terms of leading to future success beyond high school. Uh, it eliminates the time to degree completion in whatever type of pathway that student might be pursuing, whether it's a certificate, a license, a two-year, a four-year degree. Uh, it reduces the cost of a college education because if we, through these programs and supports we're trying to provide, make college coursework more accessible, uh, it makes the total cost of earning a degree, again, whatever that might be, uh, it reduces those costs as well. So there's great power to, to the work that we're talking about today. And, and we want to continue that conversation um, and hear from three key community leaders, education leaders, and in particular leaders that have helped and will continue to lead the dual enrollment expansion. So it's my honor today to introduce uh, Dr. David Borofsky, He's the Interim Executive Director for the Arizona Community Colleges Coordinating Council. Every, we all call it the AC4. Uh, Brad Kendricks, Vice President for Finance and Administration and Chief Financial Officer for the Arizona Board of Regents. Uh, and Michelle Udall, Associate Superintendent for School Improvement uh, at the Arizona Department of Education. Uh, thank you for joining us today, for bringing your point of view and your perspective. Uh, and so I'm gonna ask a couple of questions of the panel members but let's also encourage those of you that are watching, if you have questions, please submit them and we'll try to get to as many as we can or address them in follow-up activities. So to begin the panel conversation, I'd like to begin by, again, good morning, Michelle. I'm gonna start with you uh, and see if you might give us your perspective and that of the State Department of Education on why dual, enroll why dual enrollment is an important strategy for helping us to boost our college success in Arizona and talk about that creative uh, future ready workforce that we're trying to create as well. Good morning, thanks for having me. Um, I think we've seen so much of the research on how important dual enrollment is and what a great tool it is for students to be successful. We got to see your research earlier and you know I've had the opportunity to go to Helios and sit in the decision theater and look at that those details on how impactful that is for students and how well they do in future college classes even on the same subject that it really does prepare them for what's coming next not only prepares them but it gives them the confidence to know that they can do it um, and that they can be successful in college and so um, that's what so many of our students particularly first generation college students need is the confidence to believe that they can do it and the experience doing it to know that they can handle that level of rigor um, so it's just so important that our students have that opportunity, regardless of where they're going to school. So regardless of where they live, um, that every student in the state has the opportunity to have take these courses and to have that confidence builder um, wherever they're at. Thank you for that. Um, uh, so I want to ask David, uh, as, a, as a representative of Arizona's community college system, uh, really one of the, the leading institutions often in uh, advocating for and implementing uh, dual enrollment for so many students. How are the community colleges uh, preparing to partner with the K-12 school system, with other stakeholders to really get at the expansion efforts that I, I know we're all committed to? And maybe talk more specifically about how do students actually enroll in dual enrollment courses? Where do they go? Uh, and how might we uh, ensure that we're providing the information that students and families need to get connected to the colleges? Well, thank you for that question, Paul. And good morning, everyone. Uh, AC4 and the 10 community colleges here in Arizona are so excited about this legislation. Uh, while we've had, uh, as the research demonstrates, increases in dual enrollment students, we know we can do so much more. 
And it really is about what people have already talked about. It's about relationships. It's really about counselors from the school districts and teachers from the school districts working with our community college, dual enrollment staffs and our faculty to make sure that those students who really want to be involved in the dual enrollment program can get involved. Our 10 community colleges start at different times in the fall semester. The earliest is August 12th. Uh, the latest is August 28th. I'm really going to encourage you all to reach out uh, to the community colleges. And if, and if you have questions and can't get an answer for some reason or another, uh, before the end of this, I will put in uh, the Arizona Community Colleges.org website uh, into the chat room. And you can always reach out to me through that. And I, and I can uh, broker a relationship. I can work with you to make sure that uh, that you're involved with your community colleges. We serve all Arizona. We want all students to be involved. And, and I know you didn't ask me this, but I need to tell just a quick story uh, because it's an important story. We have a student in one college uh, who heard the presentation about dual enrollment. Uh, his mom had unfortunately just passed and his dad had never been to college. He decided to give it a try uh, and he ended up graduating with not only an associate, not only a high school diploma, but an associate's degree uh, within a two-week time period. So those are the kinds of success stories that we have seen in every college here in Arizona at the community colleges. And I'm sure Brad will talk about the universities as well. And it's really important for people to understand that this sets, as Paul, you said, and others did, really sets a student on a path of success throughout his or her life. And that's what we're here for, student success. Without a doubt. Thank you, David, for sharing that. And, and, and well said, and appreciate you sharing that story. I'm, I'm also just going to uh, uh, acknowledge that to any of our panel members, if you want to kind of piggyback off of each other's statements, please kind of get my attention. We're happy to do that. I want to make sure we create a, a, a sharing and exchange of information um, but I also want to piggyback off David's comment about why, why, why now, why the webinar today, and it really is to the point you just made, you know, now is the time for us to ensure that we're focused on getting enrollments into to these dual enrollment classes, there's many different opportunities and ways to do that, we will make sure throughout this webinar and in follow up communications that we provide a lot of that information. Uh, I want to pivot to Brad, and, and as uh, indicated, the role of the Arizona Board of Regents uh, in, in its leadership role, and, and maybe ask Brad to help us understand how the uh, investment of new dollars, the $15.5 million that we just spoke about through this past legislative session, how that can really help students access uh, dual enrollment, how do they access the funding, you know, what do we need to be sharing with students today, as well as with teachers around how they get access to the teachers, Arizona Teachers Academy, uh, which I know the, the Board of Regents are, are uh, so big champions of. So, so Brad, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, so, yes, as we've cited here, you know, getting more students into dual enrollment is great for trajectory, great for building resilience to get through college education. But the first step to actually get them into those programs is to have teachers qualified to teach with partner institutions. So that's really where the state universities and some of this new legislation are keying in is to help move our high school teachers into a place where they can facilitate these courses and be part of that college learning experience. So in order to do that, we've leveraged the Arizona Teachers Academy, which has existed for several years now to help uh, deal with the teacher shortage in Arizona. So what the Arizona Teachers Academy does is it covers uh, any gap between financial aid and tuition and fees for students in, uh, who are enrolled in teacher education programs. So that's great. And we're really focusing on that to bring in more uh, college students to become professional educators. However, that program is also eligible for teacher enrichment. So the, whether that be uh, applying for um, national certification, whether that be getting a master's degree in the teaching field, but it relevant to this webinar, it's also getting the credits necessary in order to be qualified as a dual enrollment teacher. So while most people are thinking about enrolling in a, a graduate program or an actual degree program, you actually don't have to in order to get the benefits of the Arizona Teachers Academy. So uh, over in the chat, there's a link to the ArizonaTeachersAcademy.com, which is our landing page for this work. But it's really important to highlight that because there, there are links to both Northern Arizona University and Arizona State University, which help us to facilitate 
this part of the offering. And that is to allow our current teachers who need to get 18 graduate credit hours in a teaching field in order to teach college level classes in their high schools to be able to get those courses. So if you go to either of uh, those universities' websites, there's an interest form that you would fill out. There's links to courses and groups of classes that are eligible for this programming. And that spans from communication and English to economics, math, and sciences. Uh, but you can go pick out those classes. You can work with the universities to register. And the really important thing is you register through the university and you fill out a free aid for a federal student or a free application for federal student aid to FAFSA. Super important for students, also super important for you because that's how this program is administered. You fill out a FAFSA and sign up for those courses and the university works with you to have the Teachers Academy cover those costs. So it's a, a really elegant way to get those extra credits. So thank you. So David, please, uh, uh, it sounds like you might, it looks like you might want to piggyback off that. I, I do. I, I just want to emphasize the importance of faculty, that they are really the linchpin of, of everything we're talking about here. Not only do they teach our students, but they develop relationships with our students. They're going to help them get through classes and help them move on to a, the next course. So Anything you all can do uh, to help those faculty members get those 18 credits necessary by for accreditation standards to uh, be able to teach dual enrollment courses it is ultimately going to help the student. And again, I, I know I'm uh, repeating myself, but that's what it's all about, student success and, and moving Arizona forward. Without a doubt. So, um, and we kind of heard from from David and Brad about, you know, kind of from the university's perspective, the college's perspective. So I want to pivot back to you, Michelle. I know you've been number one, a longtime individual champion of dual enrollment expansion uh, in a number of different leadership roles that you've had. Um, but from a from a Department of Education perspective, you know, how, how what do we need to know? What can we share about what the department is doing as well in this space in increasing dual enrollment? And how uh, what information do we need to share with students and families uh, about how they can engage now that we've got some momentum building? That's a fantastic question. I'm seeing a lot of questions about it in the chat, too, about how um, how is this going to work? How does this funding work? So the $15 million will go to reimburse costs for dual enrollment. But rather than having the students pay it up front, we're gonna reimburse the providers directly. And by providers, we mean the community college or the whoever's granting the college credit. Um, so the, the providers, the community college or the whatever college is giving that college credit will sign the student up. Um, they will need to collect certain information and we're working on the easiest way to streamline that. Um, because they have to know if the student qualifies for free and reduced lunch, they need to know the student's GPA, um, those kind of things, but they will sign them up and waive up to $50 per credit hour for each student they sign up that qualifies. Um, and then when the student finishes the class, they'll send a report to us with the student, the course they did, what program that qualified them for, and all that information, and we will reimburse the providers directly so that the students have, don't have to front the money um, we'll be able to do that in a in a way that those low income students can actually do it because if we make them pay at first and then reimburse, we're going to have problems. Um, but we're trying to make that as simple as possible. But we'll just need a single report from those providers in January if it's a semester course that finishes in December, or in June if it's if it finishes in May, and then we will send a check. So thank you, Michelle, for sharing that. And I, I'm glad you picked up on that. We're seeing some of those questions as well. And so we're trying to get as much of that information out uh, to our audience today during the webinar, uh, but we're also committed to, to following up as well. So any questions that you might provide or that you might have that we don't get to during the conversation, our goal is to, to respond and communicate back out in a number of different ways to provide that information. So that, that's really an important element of what we're trying to do with the webinar today is to get this new information out around opportunities to expand dual enrollment. You know, and, but there are also challenges. So I'm just going to ask an open-ended question to the panel. Um, you know, so so what are the, the traditional barriers or challenges uh, for students or families or even the institutions themselves that, that we're also trying to address and work on that so we can try to eliminate some of the challenges from the past? Um, um, how do we how do we engage in data sharing agreements so that we can also track and understand 
where there's opportunities for, for greater impact and, and increased dual enrollment participation. So I wanted to see if, if you all had any thoughts or wanted to speak to that question of eliminating barriers, creating more collaborative opportunities uh, for students and families. Well, I'll start. Uh, as a longtime higher education person, uh, it, it makes me sad now to think about um, how people look at higher education and, and the need for higher education. So I think one of the barriers that we have that we're working so hard to overcome on the community colleges level uh, is making sure people understand why education is so important and what it does for not only the student, but the family, the community. Uh, certainly when we were down at Helios looking at some of the data and we could see the, the higher education levels and and the success of a community based on what those levels uh, were like. And if the higher the level, the, the arguably the more successful the community could be and also the family could be. Um, and, and I think that's a major barrier that a dual enrollment program in many of our schools uh, will help overcome. We had, we had one high school in Yuma County who graduated 59 students with an associate's degree, that, that is, as well as their high school diploma. That is really going to help the Yuma community in terms of, of what those students are going to bring. It, it changes the socioeconomic levels. It, it does all that work. And I, I think that overcoming the, the notion that higher education isn't needed anymore is a barrier that we all really have to work on. Yes, CTED is important. Uh, CTED really helps us because it, makes, uh, it gives people skills that, that help everyone. Uh, but we also need to work on the other side of, of higher education as well. So I think it's that's a barrier that comes to mind immediately for me that we need to overcome. Any other thoughts or comments from Michelle or, or Brad? Please, Brad. Yeah, so if I may, uh, I think besides just thinking about the value and getting students interested in these offerings, besides building the pipeline, you know, the teachers and the students that are eligible to teach these classes, we need to not underestimate the impact of the friction in our boring administrative processes to make this actually happen. So we talked about information sharing. We talked about the relationships between the high schools and the colleges that are offering the, the credits. It is super important that we take a hard look at those things and try to find the smoothest way from the student and family perspective to get that paperwork processed and done. Because very often we find ourselves relying on the families to bear the burden of figuring out some of these details of how it works, to fill out the aid applications, to fill out the extra paperwork for making college credit apply to high school. And in many ways, I think you might be leaving some students behind who are even willing to take the class and do the work, but aren't necessarily in a position to fully follow through with the process to get that done. So this, uh, this process of getting some of it paid for for the students, I think will help a lot. Uh, but the administrative processes, uh, let's not underestimate the impact of those on families as well. And I would just, as we've been talking about some of the processes, um, as I've been talking to providers and about the struggles that they have, one of those is getting the free and reduced lunch uh, status of students, particularly if it's a CTED that doesn't have that information from the high school or it's the community college trying to find out. We've been talking about just maybe putting a box on the form that says I'm applying for the waiver and the, my high school has the has my permission to release that to the community college for this purpose, that information. So all they're doing is checking a box and signing the form that they already have to fill out <clears throat> to reduce that burden to the student. Because one extra step for the student is a roadblock in this case. Yeah. Um, so if we can waive the, free, the fee up front, and then be reimbursed from ADE when the course is done. If we can make it just an extra box to check instead of a whole extra set of forms, um, <clears throat> then we really simplify that process and the likelihood that a student will follow through. Without a doubt. Thank you for sharing that. David? Thank, thank you, Paul. I, I want to echo what Brad said. Um, I, I really do think it's important that, uh, that processes are, are streamlined. Uh, I know that's not always easy, uh, but the, the reason that it's so important is that uh, basically what Brad said, you leave students behind because they get frustrated and they aren't interested in working through the uh, cumbersome and sometimes in some cases uh, issues that we have. So I would really encourage you 
um, the way that we have worked it in the past is we've always just found that one person who can get through all the stuff. I mean, and it really is just stuff. Um, and and so I would encourage the the community colleges to have a point person for this program because it is so important and it will make such a huge difference to not only the community colleges, but the universities and the success of students. So uh, anything that AC4 and, and our 10 colleges, 10 community colleges can do to help in this process, uh, we stand ready to, to try and uh, share streamlined processes with each other so that we can move forward in a way that's going to help. And, and if I could, I just want to speak to the acknowledgement of the the education sort of ecosystem that's represented on this panel and, and even much broadly uh, in the work of expanding dual enrollment. The, the fact that the, the, the education system is coming together to work together on how do we better support students in this dual enrollment pathway is, is one that we should acknowledge and celebrate. Oftentimes we recognize and acknowledge that sometimes we, we unintentionally work at cross purposes or aren't always as collaborative as we ideally would like to be or intend to be. Uh, but so, so when there's an example like this where we are coming together as a community, where we are coming together with a single-minded focus of improving access here to education attainment opportunities that we know will help to build the case of of why post-secondary education success is so important to our state, you know, to, to reinforce, I know many of us partnered together uh, with uh, Education Forward Arizona recently to release a report called Billions to Gain, which describes very specifically the economic impact to our state, to our individuals, to our families of, of the economic impact and increase um, of post-secondary success at, at multiple levels, at different levels, and came to the conclusion that there are billions of dollars annually of increased revenue and investment in our state that is directly associated with increasing our, our degree and college completion efforts uh, in the state. So this fits right into helping to drive that narrative that college is a valuable uh, element of success for our community as we move forward. So I want to ask the panel one last question as we start to wind down, and I'm going to open it up and see if Travis uh, on our team has any specific questions that we want to follow up on. But what, what do you look for in the near term for success for this particular initiative? You know, so what's top of mind to each of you that you want to maybe focus all of our attention on that would help us define what success in expanding dual enrollment might be in the near term. So take liberties on how you want to frame that, but I want to get us focused on success and, and successful outcomes. So Brad, let me start with you if that's okay. I think for us, it's a pickup in the availability of dual enrollment classes. It's how can we make sure that schools statewide all have an equitable supply of the types of classes that we're talking about so that all students have at least the potential of getting exposed to some of these college credits uh, while they're in high school and have the opportunity to smooth the path into college. Absolutely. Michelle? Um, I think there are about three criteria we can look at. Um, an increase in enrollments for dual enrollment. Um, I'd love to see an increase or at least stay stable with the percent passing those classes. We have, it's a very high success rate in those classes. And then I'd like to see an increase in the number of schools offering dual enrollment classes. Yeah. David? So I believe the number was 25% of students taking dual enrollment classes. I'd like to see that double. Uh, let's have a stretch goal here. Uh, let's let's double it. Um, I'm not sure how many faculty have uh, dual enrollment certifications, but whatever it is, I'd like to see that double as well. Uh, the more faculty that are available to teach those classes, uh, the more students will be able to take them. Um, and I'd, I'd like us all to be looking at enrollment processes. I know someone put in the chat window that um, we are guided by HLC. I, I think that's true, uh, but we also need to look at that and see how we can uh, work through that to make sure that our, our uh, administrative uh, processes are less burdensome. So I want to open it up. I know we're not going to be able in the limited time we have available for the webinar to get at every question that might be coming our way. So I'm going to acknowledge again, we appreciate the questions. We will do our best to follow up and provide 
information uh, to you to provide if you have a specific question uh, that we can answer or, or provide you a, a link or guidance to where your questions might uh, might get addressed. Um, and Paul, you know, real briefly, can I just sure. say, I have a PowerPoint of information of some of the implementation details on ADE's side that I will be sharing and you guys are, I understand, will send out to everybody on here. So Thank some you. of those details that we don't get to today, we'll send, I'll send out in that PowerPoint. Thank you so much. Uh, so everybody look forward to that and, and we will make sure we get that out to all participants in the webinar. So thank you, Michelle, for that. Um, the, one of the questions I did see come through that I wanted to just speak to a little bit and see if others might have thoughts or even other of our panel members who might have some information. There was a question around, uh, you know, why dual enrollment versus advanced placement? Uh, is there a difference? Is, you know, what, you know it, what do we need to understand between the two? And, and from my understanding, and I'll see, I'll, I'll definitely defer to the, to the experts, but um, I, I know that uh, from a research perspective, we've dug into that and we have data that shows that. And I think in general, it's fair to say both are valuable, both have impact, uh, both bring, you know, the whole idea of rigorous curriculum and academic preparedness of students in high school to ensure that they're better prepared as they transition into either a community college or a technical environment or directly into a university environment. Both advanced placement and dual enrollment have, through research, shown the ability to increase post-secondary attainment for all students. But I think there is some nuanced differences between the two in terms of how they're administered. Uh, one area, for example, is uh, achievement of, of course credit. Um, you know, there's a different pathway for advanced placement that you take a you take a final test that you have to score a certain uh, level on in order to get potential credit, um, and then that credit, you know, uh, can can or potentially can be applied into a, a post secondary education environment. Uh, dual enrollment seems to give that that credit directly. You know, once you pass the class, once you've earned that grade. You know that that credit is there and available as as a difference, uh, but again, not here to promote one or the other. Really, to advocate the importance of of us all working together to to academically prepare our students and in every other way we can prepare our students for success beyond high school. So I just wanted to speak to advanced placement dual enrollment. See if anybody else has any information to add specifically to that question uh, beyond what I have shared. Well, I think the only thing I would add is that uh, current with the current legislation that was passed, the dual enrollment program uh, will be less will be more cost effective uh, than perhaps an AP course would be because an AP course sits out on its on its own. It's important, uh, and they uh, they do have uh, extreme value to a student. Uh, the dual enrollment process and the dual enrollment program, um, really is one that it, and I think it was Michelle or someone earlier who talked about guided pathways. This is a pathway. Dual enrollment is a pathway to an associate degree. An AP course sits on an island. There may be lots of islands that make up those AP courses, uh, but it's it's not as structured as the dual enrollment process is, as I understand it right now. And I think this is where, and I know today in our webinar, we have a number of individuals who serve as counselors in the school district, in the school system. And, and I would, one, want to thank and acknowledge the important role that they play in serving students and families in our communities, um, and just acknowledge them and highlight them as a great source, a great resource to help students understand which of these pathways is, in fact, given their interests and desires uh, the best for them. But we know and we're advocating today, especially in this webinar, uh, really the unique value and importance of, of dual enrollment and how it can serve uh, the purposes for, for many students and our education uh, goals as a state uh, as well. So Travis, let me see if there's any questions, any burning questions you have from the audience that you'd like this panel to speak to uh, before yeah. we wrap up. We're going to do some rapid fire. We're, we're not going to be able to get to all the questions, but I'm prioritizing ones that have been asked multiple times. I'm going to kick the first one to Brad, which is about uh, the certification process. You know, just sort of walking through those requirements. Um, there was a question about whether there are venues other than the Arizona Teachers Academy for uh, acquiring that certification. Um, and there was a question about whether um, teachers who are already uh, certified or eligible for the bonus, or if it's just new 
uh, certifications that would be eligible for the bonus. Thanks. So I can take at least the first half of that. So one thing that I think is worth noting is that certification for dual enrollment isn't a certification in the truest sort of frame certificate sense where you're getting a, a gold star. What it is is that you have to have at 18 graduate credit hours in the field to be taught. And then that gets certified by the partner community college so that it meets accreditation requirements. So the trick here is to look at the field that you're looking to teach in and ensure that you have those 18 credits uh, above and beyond that. So each of the universities offers different tracks for getting some of those credits if you don't have them already. But some people come in with some of those credits and you just need one or two classes in order to round it out. So the real trick is to look back on your individual uh, college transcripts and look at any graduate coursework and see how that aligns with the different fields that your school is offering dual enrollment classes in. Um, but that again is a relationship between the high school districts and the community college partners about getting those individual teachers qualified to teach in each of the fields that classes are offered in. Um, I'll look over to Michelle to see if she can add up any more context as it relates to the teacher bonuses and uh, current certified. Um, this isn't the part I've dug into as much, but they do have to be new getting that certification this year. I saw that question has come up several times in the chat. That is one of the requirements for them to receive the $1,000 bonus is it has to be a new dual enrollment certification this year, and they have to be teaching a dual enrollment course this year. Okay. Great, thanks. Um, there's a question that we need to walk through again in terms of the, the reimbursement process. There have been questions about do students have to lay out any money up front? You know, how do the funds flow? I just, I think it'd be good to just walk through that. Absolutely. So um, no, we don't want the students have to pay the money up front and then be reimbursed. We're asking that the providers um, allow them, grant them the waiver up front, um, and then we will reimburse that to the provider directly. So to the community college or the college directly, we will reimburse them for waiving that fee for the student. Um, that way the student never needs to pay it up front because that's going to be a huge barrier for our low-income students. So no, they will not pay it up front. We'll take care of that on the back end. Great, thank you. Uh, also several questions about uh, concurrent enrollment and whether that is at all eligible for this funding. Um, so no, according to the statute, it has to be dual enrollment, meaning it's taken at the high school um, on the high school or CTE campus. Um, so this, this funding only qualifies for those courses. And how about the eligibility for undocumented students? Um, the, the language doesn't address it. Um, at the high school level, we're not allowed to ask whether or not students are documented. Um, and so it shouldn't make any difference. As, as far as I can tell, there shouldn't be anywhere that that becomes an issue. Um, we weren't asking for that information. Got it. Uh, we had a question about eligible providers. Is it just public colleges and universities, or is it ex also extended private nonprofit? Um, I'm just so as it, legislate. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, as it relates to using ATA funding to get those classes, uh, that is currently limited to Arizona State University and Northern Arizona University. They both offer classes that meet this requirement as part of the ATA program. You can get credits from any graduate degree in order to qualify for dual enrollment teaching, but in order to get access to the ATA funding, it has to be through one of our state public universities. And for the dual enrollment, to be the provider for the dual enrollment, it says um, qualifying provider means a community college, university, or institution that provides a qualifying dual enrollment course. Um, the course has to give lower division gen ed credit at a, at a university, so it has to be an acceptable credit to ABOR or to a community college um, or be a CTE course that is required for a certificate. Um, so if it's a course that meets those requirements, that the course is accepted by community college or, um, or elsewhere, then they can, it looks like they could be that provider. That's some of the details that I will include in um, the PowerPoint that goes out. That would be great. Thank you so much. So 
I, I know we're kind of winding down towards our time. So what I'd like to do in, in the limited time we have is uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't give our panel members sort of one uh, uh, last opportunity to make maybe just a brief statement. If there was anything you, you didn't get the chance to share or something you want to focus attention on, kind of a closing comment, uh, and then we'll wrap up the webinar uh, with our thanks and appreciation to everybody's participation again. So, uh, David, let me start with you this time. Great. Thank you, Paul. I, I just want to thank everybody, uh, as Paul did in the beginning, for taking time to uh, to come to this webinar, to, to be involved, and to uh, understand uh, what, as best you can, is uh, how we're going to increase dual enrollment students here in the state of Arizona. There are some great questions out there. We, can, we ask that you continue to ask them. Uh, and someone, Michelle, Brad, uh, Paul and his staff, myself, uh, will make sure that we get those answers to you as quickly as we can, uh, because this really is important. Thank you. Brad? I'll just add that you know this is really timely. It's a hugely important topic for all of our goals of getting more students through higher education and into the workforce in Arizona. And the idea of equipping our students with some real tangible connections to college and some credits in their pocket before all of the real life stuff happens through their college experience uh, can be nothing but good for the potential of getting them through with the degrees we need. Michelle? I just want to express the urgency to get this information out to students. Um, if, stu if, if schools don't know about it, if the counselors don't know about it, we're not going to get the students signed up in higher numbers. If, um, if students don't know about it, they're not going to sign up. Um, that cost has always been a significant barrier for our low-income students. And so um, I just hope that we can really get the word out quickly since it's coming so quickly. It's this school year. Um, students are already signed up in many cases but wherever possible to increase the number of students that are signing up for these courses um, that are prepared for them. Um, there's just a real urgency to this and we have to express that urgency to our high school partners um, throughout the state so that they can get it out to their students. Great, thank you so much for that. So let me let me just wrap down, uh, wrap up the webinar. I, I do want to thank our panel members. I know we can't, you know, we'll give you a round of applause, but nobody can really hear it, but I do want to thank you uh, for, for your leadership and taking the time representing the educational institutions that are critically are so critical to the success of, of just education in Arizona uh, and participating in this webinar with us. I want to thank you and all of our speakers um, for that. Um, and maybe just end with, with what Michelle was saying towards the end as well, just to, to lean in on that. And that's this idea of a sense of urgency. Um, you know, when, when you do education work, you do community work, um, there, are, there are not often opportunities where you kind of start to feel uh, all elements of, of engagement come together, whether in this case, it's, it's how research helped to build the case of the importance of rigorous coursework and, and dual enrollment and advanced placement and what could we do better and how might Arizona lead the nation in putting together meaningful policies that begin to increase uh, college access and success for all students. Um, and so you have research and policy coming together. You have uh, partners in the education system bringing resources and funding and, and changing protocols so that we work together better. Uh, all that was kind of shared as part of this. Uh, I wanna acknowledge, I wanna celebrate, but I also wanna use that as a leverage point for all of us kind of participating today to, to recognize that we have a unique opportunity to create meaningful change when it comes to improving student outcomes and student success. Um, and dual enrollment is, is one big piece of that. There are many others. Hopefully the spirit of collaboration and partnership will then broaden out to other areas where we can continue to do this type of collaborative work uh, to improve education outcomes. But in particular here, the time is now to get this information out, okay? We, we are in some respects leading the way in how we're removing barriers for access to dual enrollment for all students across all parts of Arizona. Um, and as a, a kid born and raised in rural Arizona myself, I can assure you, I know how important it is for, for rural-based students as an example to, to have these types of opportunities that might not normally be there um, given uh, the geography of where we might be raised and such. And so this is really important work for all of our students, for all of our school districts, 
uh, and our entire education system. And, and the ability for us participating today to get that information out, to share that information, we will try to do our part uh, to, to send out as much information to all of you based on this webinar, provide you the data, the information, or, or at least access to where you can get that information in, in order to, to create some meaningful momentum and change um, and, and broaden out the, the expansion of dual enrollment, which is so important as we've just talked about for the last hour. So uh, I wanna end with that for all of you is, is use this as, as an opportunity to spread the word, um, reach out to any or all of us if you have questions or need for support. Uh, we wanna continue to work together on this and we know we will be delivering results. And I look forward to another opportunity down the road where we can come back and talk about the successes and talk about where else do we go. You know, the, the idea that this will create the type of uh, future workforce that we wanna have for the state of Arizona to drive our economy forward. This is a critical piece of that. So I thank everybody for participating today, all the individuals that made this webinar happen, all of our guest speakers uh, today, uh, and in particular to all of you participating. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your commitment to education and support of all students. We look forward to continuing to work with you. So with that, the, we'll, we'll end the webinar and say, everybody, please have a great, safe, cooler day here in Arizona.